many of you will recognize uh, this first picture here, which is, of course, of the historic uh, Paris Climate Accord in which 195 countries agreed to limit the increase in global temperatures to below two, and a half, uh, two degrees relative to pre-industrial time with a concerted effort to keep those increases below one and a half degrees. That requires emissions to peak very, very quickly in the next decade or so and then start to decline very fast. It's an ambitious uh, agreement. And it begs the question, how did we get to such an ambitious agreement? Is this the vindication of the United Nations process, uh, which has in the past led to some degree, or at least perceived to have led to some degree of paralysis? And are we going to meet and deliver these uh, very ambitious uh, objectives? So that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and to do that and to start framing this question, I want you to uh, escort me and accompany me to the bathroom where you'll find a bath. Now, this is uh, an illustration of how the climate system works. I'm not going to talk to you about the risks of climate change, but there is one element in this process that it's really important that you understand, and that is that global temperatures and therefore the damages from climate change correlate to the stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. These gases, they sit in the atmosphere for tens, maybe hundreds of years, depending on the gas. And we emit, or the Earth emits, at a steady rate into the atmosphere. And the Earth also absorbs gases from a little drain pipe, if you are to extend the bath analogy. What matters is not how much gases we emit through the, through the tap, but how big the atmospheric concentration, how big the stock is in the bath. Well, as I say, what happened? We introduce an industrial revolution, and humanity starts putting in a lot more uh, in the form of emissions, and that bathtub starts to go up and up. Okay? And it will continue to go up until we reduce emissions back down to the rate that the Earth can naturally absorb. And this is really fundamental, because it means that if we, irrespective of what temperature we stabilize, whether it's 2 degrees or 3 degrees or toast degrees, we have to come down to net zero carbon emissions. We either do it the easy way by reducing our own emissions, or we do it the hard way by having nature impose such a hostile climate on us that it compromises our ab ability to exist on this planet. The choice is ours. But either way, we have to decarbonize. Okay, That's a really important lesson. So how much space is there in the bathtub? How much more room do we have uh, to emit emissions into that atmospheric stock? Well, the answer is not very much. The little blue circle you see there, that's the additional stock of atmospheric carbon dioxide that we can put into the atmosphere uh, if we're to meet the two degree target. The much bigger black circle, and this is to scale, is how much easily accessible carbon dioxide there is on the surface of the Earth, reserves of coal, oil, and gas. Basically, what this chart is telling you is that if we're to meet the agreement that was laid out in Paris, we have to leave most of our fossil fuels, known, easily accessible fossil fuel reserves, in the ground. This means the death of fossil fuels. Well, that's incredibly ambitious, right? And you may doubt that we're ever going to get there, but certainly what has been agreed is profound and fundamental. So what has happened to bring about this change? Well, one of the key elements of change is a change in the narrative. Up until now, the issue of addressing climate change has been expressed in terms of how we share out the costs. It's the language of burden sharing, the language of shared sacrifice. The problem with that is that it doesn't get you very far. I don't know what you think about when you think about burden sharing. Maybe you think about the weight of the earth on your shoulders. Maybe you think about an ox overladen, the, the so-called beast of burden. Not very attractive images, let's face it. You might take a more positive view and you might start thinking of ants. Ants work in a more cooperative, collaborative way. Maybe humans can replicate the collective action of ants by working to address issues uh, that are common problems uh, of humanity. Well, we're not really like ants, are we? we, we we're a very diverse set. We, we have our own traditions, our own backgrounds, our own histories. And we tend to be, as cultures, we tend to be quite competitive. And our ability to collaborate the way ants do uh, is, in that sense, somewhat more limited. A and that's the reason uh, you may have read about the, uh, the uh, well-articulated tragedies. One is the tragedy of the horizon, which, uh, to summarize a little, means that human beings struggle to uh, 
conceptualize existential risks which apply to future generations, and therefore we tend not to do very much about them. We tend to leave them for future generations in the hope that they can cope better. And the tragedy of the commons, which is uh, for an issue like climate change where we know the cost of our individual actions to reduce emissions, but the benefits accrue to absolutely everyone. And that provides us with an incentive to free ride on the actions of others. In other words, uh, not pay the costs, but benefit from the actions that others have taken. And as a result of this, everybody waits for everybody else to go, and there's very limited action. And to some extent, that does characterize the last few decades. There has been progress on reducing emissions, important progress, and I'll come back to that. But it hasn't been as fast as we would have liked. That tap that you saw before is still running, and it's on full. It's never been higher. Okay? And we need to get that tap pretty much to be closed. So again, what changed prior to the Paris Agreement? Well, uh, the biggest, most fundamental change is the emphasis on opportunity and self-interest. And that was driven by this. It's a, it's a busy chart. Please don't focus on the details. But what it shows are two leading renewable technologies, solar photovoltaic on the left, and wind power on the right. And the costs of these technologies, as we've deployed them, as we've experimented with them, as we've learned from our experimentation, have come down dramatically. Solar PV costs have fallen by a factor of five in as many years. The cost of wind power, a rather more mature technology, has also uh, come down by 40% over that time period. OK, you might say, well, the wind doesn't always blow, and the sun doesn't always shine, so we're still going to need a base load generation from fossil fuels. Well, actually, battery storage costs have been coming down dramatically as well. Lithium-ion battery costs have fallen by 40% over the last four years. And as, uh, you know, as the likes of Elon Musk's Gigafactory uh, uh, expand the production of his power wall, we're going to see even further reductions of those costs over the coming years. So these costs are now not only much lower than they were in previous years, but they are now fully competitive in many parts of the world with coal, with gas, and with oil. And they will continue to become competitive in other parts of the world as well. And that's without a carbon price. If you were to apply a carbon price, they're already pretty much competitive in most parts of the world. So that's the story uh, of, uh, of opportunities, the fundamental reduction in cost. But there are other elements to this opportunity uh, story, and very important ones as well. There has been a much wider recognition of the importance of energy security, of being able to generate your own energy without being reliant on importing vast stocks of oil, coal, gas from other countries. There's been an emphasis on energy efficiency, the ability to operate your economy, getting more out of the resources you have by economizing on energy. That reduces costs as well as reduces emissions, so it's an opportunity. There's pollution as well. Uh, just one pollutant, a particulate pollutant called PM2.5 in China, according to the World Bank, has been held responsible for reducing Chinese GDP, Chinese annual output, by a staggering 12%. OK, 12% of annual GDP is lost through pollution in China. Even in Europe and richer parts of the world, the World Health Organization estimates that those costs are of the order of 3 to 5% of GDP. These are not trivial numbers. If we spent 5 or 10% of GDP in reducing emissions and reducing air pollution, we would have this problem licked. And yet we somehow tolerate those orders of magnitudes of damages every year. It's the increasing realization of that kind of thing that has led to the kinds of agreements that we saw in Paris. Congestion, this picture that, that may have flashed up a couple of times. Congestion, this is a picture taken in New Delhi, but it could be Mumbai, it could be Sao Paulo, it could be Jakarta, it could be any part of the rapidly urbanizing, developing world. Hours of time of human productivity lost through congestion. Here's another form of congestion. This is a much more favorable form of congestion that is preferred amongst wealthier citizens in wealthier countries. This, of course, is Copenhagen. And I, I don't know how many of you have been to Copenhagen, but if you go to Copenhagen, of course, everybody cycles. And if you ask people why they cycle, they'll usually come back at you and say, well, we have such fantastic cycling infrastructure, which is true. So then you ask them, well, how comes you have such amazing cycling infrastructure? They look at you as if you're a bit of an idiot. They say, well, everybody here cycles. Well, now, hang on. This is chicken and egg. But of course, that's the point. 
when something as desirable as cycling becomes hardwired into the common mentality, people hold politicians accountable for delivering it, and therefore you get the infrastructure to support it. And this kind of urban development, dense urban development based on public transport and cycling, is much less resource and carbon intensive than the alternative. Cities, very attractive and livable cities, like Copenhagen, like Helsinki, like Amsterdam, like Barcelona, have emissions that are uh, three, four, five times lower than comparable cities in North America with similar GDP and similar populations. Uh, Atlanta, Cincinnati, uh, Minnesota, for example. These are non trivial differences, and it's not just carbon. It's resources in general. These European cities are much less costly to run, both in terms of transport, in terms of infrastructure, and so on. And like I've said already, they're pretty livable cities uh, with a high degree of well-being. So this is a very important lesson to those developing countries which are rapidly urbanizing in India and China. Do you want cities that are both attractive and efficient, or do you want to lock into infrastructure that will last for decades and centuries that will be much more expensive to run and much more polluted? That's a key part of the story, but it's not the only part of the story. Perhaps the biggest change that has occurred, which is a result of all those realizations of opportunities that I've spoken about already, is the profit element. Businesses smell money here. This is one of the fastest growing sectors in the world. I talked about solar PV a moment ago. Solar PV, the market for solar PV has expanded 70-fold over the last decade. Not 70%, 70-fold. It is massive. It's why China is investing so heavily in this sector. World trade in environmental goods and services has increased since the financial crash at a rate that is twice as fast as world trade in conventional goods and services. That's a massive story. The market is valuing green goods and services on the stock market at about 10% above the valuation of other assets uh, over the last, again, over the period since the financial crash. Whilst at the same time, fossil fuel dependent uh, and entangled companies have seen their share prices underperform the market, in particular coal, which have been falling close to zero with a number of coal companies uh, going into bankruptcy. And that's why you get these kinds of stories. This is an advert in the, in the Financial Times. Don't, I should have said this at the beginning. Please don't try and read it. But the point is, this is six million industries around the world, companies pushing for an ambitious climate deal in Paris. You know, this is money that they're sensing. And that's why we're getting this fundamental change from uh, burden sharing from sharing of costs to opportunity and self-interest. And it's what underlay the historic deal that took place before Paris, and this is in 2014, between the US and China. They agreed on ambitious climate action and carbon emissions reductions on the back of commercial interests. It wasn't a newfound sensibility for the environment. This is a case of self-interest breeding cooperation. Not the sharing of burdens, not the sharing of sacrifices. So once you've got the US, once you've got China, once you've got the European Union, we're talking here about three quarters of the world markets suddenly seeing green climate innovation and commercialization as an opportunity. It's very difficult for Paris to have been a substantial failure. So let me try and summarize by illustrating this story in a topographical sense, not an anatomical sense, a topographical sense. These are two valleys, right? Uh, they symbolize two equilibria. If you drop a ball into either one, it sits at the bottom. That's why it's an equilibrium. The one on the left is a high-carbon, fossil-fuel-intensive world, the world we live in. The one on the right is a low-carbon world. They are both equally cost-effective. There is no reason, and this is widely accepted, there is no reason if we were to all move to a renewable world that it will be more expensive to generate energy from the sun, from the wind, from the water, for example, rather than employing people across the world to dig the stuff up, suck it out of the ground, put it into ships, put it into pipes, transport it across the world, burn it in what is essentially industrial revolution technologies, and then transmit it to individuals. That's very costly. Now, of course, getting to that green world will require a lot of investment. And that's exactly what this shows. We start here with all of that infrastructure I've just spoken about. We've also got you know, extensive networks for cars, petrol stations, and so on. And we want to move towards decarbonization. Well, we've not only got the physical infrastructure, we've got the mindsets as well. Fossil fuel companies have a lot of money. They pay for the best researchers to think of ever, clever, ever cleverer ways to extract fossil fuels out of the ground. 
The new opportunity in renewables are usually very small and they don't have that much money. Fossil fuel companies have a lot of money. They can bend the ears of politicians. And that's why when you try to move away from that equilibrium, the losers will shout very loudly. They know who they are and they know how much they're going to lose, whereas the winners are just potential winners. But we have sequentially tried to move out of that valley. And this is the painful period. It's the period where a lot of taxpayers' money has gone into supporting renewables. The costs have been high. The costs of finance, they've been high. And the market has been quite small. This is the painful period where the right-wing press in the UK put out articles saying that climate change isn't happening, where senators in America turn up in Congress with snowballs in their hands. It's not pretty, okay? It's hard work. But eventually you get here. And this is the point that we've seen where the technology costs come down so much that you begin to be able to see the other valley. Up until now, the other valley's been over the horizon. It's been hard work. It's been about burden sharing. Now you start to see the opportunity that is available. And moving into that other valley can become very easy because expectations really matter. Up until now, people have thought, well, if I'm going to move, whether I'm a business or a mayor or a politician, if I'm going to move to innovate and invest in renewables, the financing's expensive, it's niche, the uh, costs are expensive, the technologies are expensive, and the market doesn't yet exist. But when China, the US, and Europe all move together, suddenly that all changes. Not moving becomes potentially very expensive and very uncompetitive because your competitors will steal a march on you if you don't start to move. And what you get is the kind of coordination that we've seen, you get a change in mindsets, you get a change in institutions, new business lobbies start to work to push for more policies, and the ball starts falling rather quickly into the second valley. There is an inexorable momentum of what we call tipping point dynamics. Now, I'm not saying we're there yet, but the direction of travel indicates that that has to be pretty close. And coming back to where we started, coming back to Paris, I think Paris, fundamental and profound as it was, was a reflection of, if you like, an effect rather than a cause of a much deeper momentum that is underlying society in terms of our, our ability and our willingness to address climate change. A shift from talk about costs and burdens to talking about opportunities. And maybe that's why there were so many smiles in Paris in November. Thank you very much.